and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I don't think Mel Gibson did a worse movie. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Signs, which came out in 2002. Written, produced and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Father Graham Hess, played by Mel Gibson. He's a priest who has lost his faith after his wife was killed six months ago. At the same time, the planet has started being invaded by alien creatures from outer space. And Father Hess has to question his faith, his belief, and if there are actually miracles. Just go on a limb now and go, this movie is boring as fuck. I mean, I watched this the first time it came out. I was behind M. Night Shyamalan. Um, you know, I saw the sixth sense. I didn't see this when it first came out. I mean, I I was kind of pissed off with what had happened with the sixth sense. Sixth sense had come out, people had spoiled it for me. I was like, well, fuck that. Uh, but then I watched it when it got out on DVD, and I was like, that was really good. And I realised that there was a lot of other movies, like I said. Sorry, it's coming from the person who goes to Wikipedia? Oh, yeah, there was no Wikipedia back in the fucking <laughs> 2000s, was there? You know, I didn't have internet access as easy as I did, but, you know, I... Like I said, I don't spoil things for people. People were spoiling things for me. And and we start off with Mel Gibson. Like I said, Father Graham Hess. And he's a priest who's lost his faith. Like, like we said, his wife Colleen had been killed in a car accident six months before. And he's just denounced God at this point. You know, he was very much in love with her. And he had to kind of watch her die. You know, she'd been pinned to a tree. And she was going to die there and so the police had called her and he got to hear her last words and obviously you know for a priest to see that must have really hit him hard well without the flashbacks which you do get throughout the Free film, film the yeah. first couple of minutes of the film tells you all of that without you know having to literally tell you it well, when you see him get up you know you can see the faded cross on the wall yeah, where yeah, he would have taken yeah. down the crucifix yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you yeah. can see the family picture there mm -hmm, yet mm -hmm. there's you know no wife around yeah yeah and yeah he's got the kids screaming outside yeah yeah it was setting up this family tragedy and how protective he is of his kids you know they're screaming and he runs out to the cornfield now does he run this farm I'm guessing so. You're guessing? You're guess, yeah. not Because the film doesn't tell us that, does it? No. I mean, he lives on this farm with these acres, not just a little patch, but fucking miles of corn. Now, let's just go mathematics here. So, say he was a priest six months ago, and that takes up a lot of time. So, to be an actual successful farmer at the same time would be incredibly, incredibly difficult, unless his wife was helping him farm at the time, which probably not because she would have been running the house and taking care of the children. We do have Joaquin Phoenix playing uh, Meryl, the brother, but he didn't turn up until after the wife had died and he was going off to a bit of a successful baseball career. So I could not get behind the fact that this priest or ex-priest had this farm and in six months had turned it into this great big huge massive corn producing machine enough corn that aliens could come down and flatten a mile's worth of it to make corn alien symbols <laughs> i love those crop circles i don't yeah don't get me wrong i grew up in the fucking 90s too we all saw the fucking crop circles I, yo no it's a guy with a stick and a couple of planks of wood yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the reality of it. But mm -hmm. in this film, th these aliens have left these crop circles as markers, as a way to navigate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they've they got to navigate. They've got, they got spaceships that can travel well, millions of miles, but they need corn. They need map signals in corn. Not in anywhere else. Not in, not in tarmac. Not on top of buildings. Not burnt into the ground in lasers. Just... Well, cornfield. Well, I've got to say, this is all from the character's interpretation of events from the film because we don't actually see the things from the alien's perspective. No, so we don't. So we don't know why they left them. But we do know that it's happened in many different parts of the world. Yeah. In many other cornfields. Yeah. I mean, you could you could theorise that those were where the, the alien crafts have landed and imprinted into the ground. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we could have. But, but <laughs> they, they didn't. They, yeah. they, they didn't. They just put this marker here there in the middle of this field and we then have to wait for the alien stuff to continue and and so we are, are 
are taken back to Mel Gibson, talking to the cops, you know, investigating, obviously, was it the local hoodlum boys coming around, causing trouble again, you know. But the, but the police officer, uh, played by Cherry Jones, she, she starts to explain about how, how, you know, there's other things going on in the town, in Bucks County. You know, animals have started to go a bit crazy. Water tastes a bit funny. And we keep cutting back to Rory Culkin, who plays Morgan, and Abigail Breslin, who plays Bo, uh, the brother and sister, and they've got their dog, Houdini. And Houdini is not happy, doesn't like the water, and is about to try and kill them. Houdini? Bo, don't run. Now, I don't know whether it's just me, right? but I looked at this this, se this sequence here like mm -hmm. three times, right, and right. I'm trying to guess. I think that dog has been superimposed in. I don't think they're <laughs> actually there, you know, especially because the dog gets quite aggressive, you know, it bares its teeth yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. growls at yeah, them. Yeah. I just got the feeling, I was like, they, they filmed that separately and then superimposed it. I don't know, it was just, I was looking at it and I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to see the, the matte outlines yeah. of it. I just couldn't quite tell. It threw me off though, because Mel Gibson's like, I can't hear my children. I'm like, man, when I hear that, I'm like, fucking yes. <laughs> but, you know, every now and again, a parent does get worried. Like, they're not screaming and killing each other. So Something's he, wrong. Yeah, so he rushes back and finds Houdini with a, with a, a, a fork stuck in its neck, dead. And Morgan sitting there saying, oh, he was going to attack Bo. And I'm like, wait, so you, you had a bowl of water in front of this dog. The dog started getting aggressive. It went for Bo. She climbed up on the treehouse. You ran into the house, got a fork, came back and stabbed the dog. No, he was doing the barbecue. So we already had the fork in his uh, hand. Ah, yes, that's, that's right. Yeah, he was yeah. doing the barbecue. Sorry, plot holes. <laughs> no, no plot hole there. Not yet. <laughs> Uh, but you know the you know as, as the cop had already explained that there was dogs you know misbehaving etc yeah, etc yeah. et and they go back into the house and uh, they 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 make uh, Whacking Phoenix take the other dog into the barn yeah. to lock him up <laughs> make sure he doesn't hurt anybody anybody else. Oh, Joaquin Phoenix, I like him. He's an amazing actor. I've liked him in everything I've ever seen him in, but not in this. Like him and him and him and Mel Gibson come across to me like Beverly Hillbillies in this. What? You know, they are they have no intelligence. In there there is no intelligence behind them. You know, they they're in this situation and and maybe it's maybe it's the the pace of the film, maybe it's the script, maybe it's the story, maybe it's them trying to work with these things that aren't working for me that you know, like I said, he gave up a very successful, or we're told he gave up a very successful baseball career. No, he never had a chance at a baseball. Well, career. the so the 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 uh, obviously the enlister, the army enlister, was well impressed about the records that he had set. Yeah, but and then we found out from Lionel that he had. Uh, we found out from this other character, Lionel, that Meryl's character had also the record for the most strikeouts. Yeah, which is the most embarrassing record you could have. Yeah, that's true, but Meryl didn't care about that. Like, Meryl said at the end of that sequence, it felt wrong to swing. And so for me, I'm like, man, that guy wanted to play baseball and... You know, it's terrible at it. We he wouldn't listen to his coaches. He, he, no, like, how right. could he have a career in it? Because he had to. Because he had these great swings. You know, he set the record for the most distance. Yeah, okay, he struck out. That doesn't mean anything. All he has to do is go off the camp and try to work that out of himself. But, but he didn't. But he yeah. didn't. We don't. Yeah, we don't get that from the film. It's like. One person thinks he's really, really good. Another person thinks he's shit. But he gave it all up so that he could live on this farm with Mel Gibson. Well, yeah, he's there to kind of help out his brother who's dealing with the loss of his wife. But it also seems like Meryl is the one who is more like a child and is being fathered by his older brother. Yeah. And it, and then you take into account the children. Bo has a thing against water. You know, she tastes it, she goes, oh, it's contaminated. Nobody questions her. Oh, she's always done it. So we've just got glasses and glasses of water lying all over the house, you know? And I'm like, that's not what a normal parent does. After a while, you would put a stop to it because it is a waste. You are just 
wasting water now. You don't know the reasons why. And then on top of that, you take into account Morgan's character. He's very intelligent, smart ass little bastard, probably getting trying to come over the get over the fact that his mother has died. But you're telling me for six months the father has done nothing to try and console his children? Because that's what I'm getting from this. Yeah, completely. The, it's a broken family. It, yes, it is it is a broken family, but not in a good way. No, not in a good way. No, not no. in a good way the film's delivering. That's what I'm saying. I think the film delivers it really well. You can see that they're fractured and that they're trying to heal. Uh, and, and as a result, some of the characters are really introverted and they're not just saying exactly how they feel. You know, the Shyamalan is putting it on screen for you to, to look at and observe and draw your own conclusions to what's happening with each of these characters. Yeah, I, well, I don't have to draw my own conclusions. I take from my own experiences well, yeah, and things Yeah, that's exactly what like you would that. do with that. But it, and, and that's where it comes across false to me. You know, it's... You know, there was a there's a part in the movie that really got me. Uh, you know, later on, it's not anything spoilers, but there's a sequence where where Morgan says to Meryl, "I wish you were my dad," mm -hmm. and Meryl turns around to him and says, "Don't you ever say that again? Don't you ever say that?" That point was the most poignant emotional part of this whole family relationship for me because, like you said, none of them are talking for six months. Six months, you're not going to talk to any of your children about a tragedy that happened. Even the uncle is not going to talk about it. You know, it's like with the, the certain lines where Mel Gibson starts coming up going, Did I tell you what, your, what my wife said before she died? She said, See. And her eyes glazed a bit. And then she said, Swing away. Wait, you didn't tell him that six months ago? Your wife's been buried this whole time and you didn't think to tell your brother something really special that your wife had said to him that might have actually healed something. So I'm starting to not like Mel Gibson's character for how inverted he is, how, 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 how selfish he's actually being with his own emotional, with his own emotions over his wife. You know, it's you've got two children. Now, I can understand not trying to talk to your brother because you know, brothers don't sometimes talk, but you've got two children there and you can certainly see that they are suffering. But you're not doing anything to heal it. You're a priest. Okay, you're pissed off at God, that's fine, but don't take it out on everybody else. But we start to see the uh, aliens um, start to kind of appear. I mean, we see one at night hiding <laughs> on, on the roof. roof. <laughs> Um, this, is a, this is one of the comedy scenes in the film where, you know, he explains that he saw the thing and his brother's there and they're like, okay, we're going to run out around the house yeah, yeah. and circle around yeah. and draw him out and we'll, we'll surround him. Yeah. And he's just, he's trying to gear up Mel Gibson to like, you're going to run out there and you're yeah, going to curse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, well, I don't know how to curse. I don't know how to curse. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I've spent my whole life as a priest. All I've done is good things. I don't know how to do this. And I'm like, that's even more false. Because you would have at least done bad things as a kid before you became a priest. You'd have done things with your younger brother that might have got you in trouble. So you must know how to... You're telling me you don't know how to protect your own family on this farm in the middle of fucking nowhere. You know, where you, we've already known that they've had trouble with kids coming around. Or, or there is a local group of hoodlums who do cause trouble. So... You know, they must have dealt with them, but as a comedy part, I liked it, but it completely threw the pacing of the movie for me. Really? How? Because it was... Because, because we've just set up the fact that his wife is, his wife is dead, the family is fractured, the, the aliens are invading. It wasn't advertised as a comedy, you know? People were like, oh, well, it's going to be quite serious. Well, it is. It just has comedy moments. But they... <laughs> They don't, for me, they don't fit to the pacing of the film because they're stood there gearing each other up to go out there. And I'm like, I just want to see the fucking alien now. I don't want to see these two trying to, trying to pick themselves up because as soon as they run outside and they run around the house in two opposite directions, you know, it jumps up onto the roof. So it's jumped off the roof and then through the through the, the you know the the swing and in, back into the cornfield oh well, for a second i actually thought it had jumped off the roof landed on the swing and used the swing to propel itself into the fucking field because it was that 
fast. It was that agile that we don't see any of it. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's what builds the mystery. That's what builds the suspense that you didn't really get to see it. You got a glimpse of it on the roof, an outline at best. And you know, you're you're wondering whether the character has reached the state where, you know, he's losing his mind, or whether there really was something there, or if the alien is there, then it's really creepy. And that's what I like about this film, is the fact that it is, and it is an actual alien invasion of sorts, but it's all told from the perspective of one family. And that's what makes this film, in my eyes, quite special, because you're not given all of the information. You know, you don't, you don't cut to Washington, D.C., you know, of all these scientists explaining exactly where these aliens have come from, right. what they're doing here. Yeah. You just follow this family who is watching the news on TV, and they're being told as much information as anybody else. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm trying. I am really trying. They pick up a book from the local bookstore. Yeah. Like one book. They got a local bookstore. You know, the cops say, hey, take your family out. Stop watching TV. You know, you want to get your mind past all this. You still haven't overcome the thing that you got tried to overcome six months ago. So, you know, try to do something as a family. The moment they get into town, they all split off in different directions. Right. Okay. So we're going to do something as a family. We're going to come back and eat pizza quietly. But you get Morgan and Bo to go into a local bookstore and he says, oh, have you got any books on UFOs? She's like, oh, we might have one that was accidentally sent here. I'm like, what kind of fucking bookstore is this? This is country bumpkin USA. We only have books written by white people, you know, telling us about gold and stuff like that. It's like, have you got like a, have you got like a wide range of selections? And it's like, no. And then you see the book that Morgan gets and he starts reading the information. And I was listening to Morgan give him the information, and none of the information he gets from this book fits the UFO, the extraterrestrial UFOs that we are seeing in this film. Oh, oh well, they're supposed to be quite short, about my size, um, you know, really quite intelligent. I'm like, no. He gets two no. major pieces of information from the book, and that is that if the aliens have landed, they're here for two reasons. Mm -hmm. They're here because, you know, they're here in the spirit of discovery and sharing uh, information uh, across the universe, across other, you know, species. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or they're here to harvest us or here for, for war to take the planet. Yeah. I, 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 by the half hour point of this movie, I was bored. I was bored. I was trying to get behind it, you know, because I, you know, I like some M. Night Shyamalan movies, but the, 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 direction from Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix wasn't come across well enough for me to feel emotionally attached to the family. They were so separated. They were so much separated, it felt so false, you know? To the point that when the alien invasion, when the aliens start turning up, it's like an hour and a half worth of just voyeurism. You know, the aliens don't do anything. The first time we ever see one, it stood on top of a roof just watching. I don't know why. You know, what, what's it, what is it, how is it actually here? You know, cause, because it isn't until, it isn't until about 30 minutes, 40 minutes that the, that the lights start turning up over Mexico City. You know, oh my God, there's 14 lights on this ship. It's just above us, like alien nation. It's just floating there. And people are just sat there watching. I'm like, all right, this is completely false because the military haven't even moved in, you know? But don't worry, because the next day, it appears like the aliens have gone. But they've activated their cloaking device because Joaquin Phoenix explains to us that a bird hit something and fell. But when you look at the TV screen, you can see all the cars just driving around on the motorway just like having a normal day. That city should be completely evacuated if an alien craft, if anything strange appeared above a city, the city would be completely evacuated. But no, everything just seems to carry on normal. And that's what's even weirder. Like I said, like you said, we're seeing this from this one family's perspective and none of them are freaking out. They're just... They are freaking out. No, when they're Joaquin not. When Phoenix is watching the TV and it cuts to, you know, the kids' party and they, they have got the first ever captured footage of one of these aliens. He freaks the fuck out when he sees it and it is an amazing moment in the film because you're watching him watch this 
this broadcast. Right. And when he sees right. an alien and yeah. freaks out, you freak out at the same time because no, you've seen it. No, I don't. What did that alien do? That one alien, what did he do, Gary? He was hiding in the bushes, frightened for his life. Bush! <laughs> he was, he was cowering in the corner. And then he walks across the screen. And of course, everyone screams and panics. So you can only imagine <laughs> the, the alien fuck? was in. What the fuck? So you're telling me these UFOs, these extraterrestrials, have come all this way to Earth. Yeah. Right? To hide in bushes at a kid's party. Well, it got lost or separated from, from the rest of them. And that, so it was literally hiding in the makes, bushes. That makes them even worse. That makes them even more stupid. That makes the aliens even more stupid. Yeah, they are pretty stupid. <laughs> that then that doesn't give me any tension. That doesn't build up any suspense. It just tells me that these aliens are fucking idiots and that I could name probably five other alien invasion movies. Yeah, I know, and you keep saying alien invasion. This is, is your own judgment on an alien. They, they, <laughs> it's like they are all it hostile. Is an, it is an invasion <laughs> because they are hostile, because they do start kidnapping and harvesting humans around the yeah. world. They start killing people with deadly gas. But they look more frightened of us than we, uh, as we are of them. Right. <laughs> the film doesn't actually... I would have accepted the fact if at the end of the movie it was a confusion, you know, that the aliens had come peacefully, but for some reason somebody somewhere in some other fucking country had fucked with an alien and the alien had fucking, they, they, they'd all message back to everybody saying, look, we're going to have to fucking start kidnapping people on this planet because they don't like us. But the film doesn't tell us that at all. It's because that's not what the film's about. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what is the film about then? Come on, bring it. What? It's about a family who are, who, are, who are fractured, coming together to overcome something during what, it, what is aliens landing in their back garden. Yeah, you know what? Tom Cruise did it better in War of the Worlds. Tom Cruise War of the Worlds is an overbloated CGI mess. Yeah, and it's still better than this. Because Fuck no, it's this, not. This builds up the fact that these aliens are supposed to be terrifying. Like you just said. Like you just said, the alien was cow the, the very the alien was cowering in the alien. bush, right? The alien was cowering in the bush and then walked across the lane. And Joaquin Phoenix got scared of it. So jo Joaquin Phoenix is scared of an alien that's scared of him. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. but nobody else is. Everybody else is just going about their normal days. Know, everyone we're not that hearing, was there, that film we're not was screaming in we're panic. Not, we're not seeing anything on the news to head to any emergency stations. You know, the military haven't been organised. We're not talking about any. We're not talking about anything. Like you said, we're trying to focus on this family who are fractured over the death of a uh, of a mother six months ago that they haven't actually come to grips with because the father, played by Mel Gibson, is not delivering well enough a fatherly role who is supposed to be protecting his children. He is so self-centered in himself and just wanting to do his own thing that once the aliens do start making their presence felt a bit more, we are just given more and more comedy routines. Hey, look, we've got tinfoil hats because the book tells us that the aliens can read our minds. So here's an image of us sat in our tinfoil hat. That I'd, I'd rather have, I'd rather have a, a, a newsreader fill us in on proper details about what's going on with the children watching that than them, than the children showing us the false information that they're getting from a book that has now been completely proven to be null and void because the aliens don't look anything like the things in the book. They, they even say that on the TV. There's a scientist who says there, oh, you know, there's a lot of people who will be going to school, but, you know, what do we know anymore? Everything we know about physics and science has completely changed. And I'm like, yes, exactly. That, for me, is the premise of this movie. The priest or ex-priest lost his faith in God and now he's been confronted with something that proves to a lot of the people that there are no religious significances in the world. You know, these aliens have come from somewhere else. God has nothing to do with it. But I started to get a lot of hints that, yes, like you said, it's supposed to be about religion, you know, and coincidences and miracles and, dare I say it, signs. Because that's what he starts to talk to Meryl about. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, movie. You're telling me that now I'm supposed to just believe that everything just happens for a reason. Well, I kind of know that, but then at, at, that's not cement. You can't just cement that, you know? And so when he starts talking about his wife, it's like, okay, you 
you you you're you're putting all this basis on on miracles and signs you know but things just happen you don't know what the reason is you sometimes will never get the reason for it but these things just happen and that's what i got from film i had to make that up for myself because the film wasn't wasn't it was more focused like you said on the on the dysfunctional of the family and the 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 threat of an extraterrestrial um life form making itself present to a to a planet that have never ever seen anything like that before but for me as well the film is going two different directions right at the same time and i can't keep up with it you know six cents went one direction and then twisted at the end i was like okay that makes sense this is this is like this is a complicated movie that does a hell of a lot more with a simple premise than Spielberg did with billions of dollars and giant UFOs blowing shit up. Oh, fuck. That is brain-dead popcorn fuck entertainment. Off. These aliens turn up, right? M. Night Shyamalan's in the movie. In a bigger cameo than he's ever had in any of his other movies. He's actually the guy who killed Mel Gibson's wife in a car accident. An accident. He fell asleep at the wheel. He fell asleep at the wheel. That's considered dangerous driving. Yeah. And he's free six months later to be able to just carry on and live in the town like nothing, like, like, like nothing's happened. You know, six months out, six months after he's stopped being a priest. We don't actually know how long it's been since she's died. You know, it could have been 10 years ago for all we know. And he could have been in prison for seven years. Film doesn't tell us that. We just know that... But it definitely tells you it wasn't 10 years ago. Well, it definitely... Yeah, but... It, <laughs> what I'm saying is, though, that they put so much basis on, you know, this doctor, this veterinarian, you know, and how Mel Gibson doesn't really want to speak to him because he killed his wife. But they live in the same town, but it's okay because I'm not a violent person. So when I see the person, we just kind of walk away from each other. But he has to go to the house at one point. Well, it's because Ray calls him and hangs up after you can hear some... Scrabbling in the background. Mm, yeah, and we get there and you see, you know, he, he's looking he's looking for Ray and he finds him just sat in his car and Ray's packed up all of his stuff and he's like I hear they've got a weakness to water, so I'm gonna go to a lake Where the fuck did you get that information from? Oh, well, right. he's the director, of course he'd know the main point of the story. Well, it's the same as the family, you know, they don't know all the information. We're not following scientists, right. we're he's, just getting bits of information or misinformation. He's got, he's got a scratch on his stomach. A scratch on his stomach. The aliens have turned up. So, if you don't realise that they're hostile, okay, that should be a big sign that this guy's been attacked by one, okay? Still, nobody's mobilising to do anything against them. You know, we're not. we're not... We're not hearing any of that. We are literally just focused on this. And then we go through the whole, you know, I've, I've, I've had your phone number next to my phone for six months and I meant to call you. I'm truly sorry for what I've done to you and yours. Like I said, two different points of this movie. Right, okay, aliens, I've got, I've got an alien trapped in my parlor. Um, but I'm sorry I didn't call you after I accidentally killed your wife. See ya! And he drives off. Yeah. And, and, ju and he just leaves the priest there. Now, the priest goes into the house and wants to see this thing. Like we all want to see this fucking thing. You know, because we've barely seen anything uh, in, in it. And, he, he, you know, I, I did really, really like that shot where he got down and he got the knife out and he's trying to look. And he, he walks off very far away and then changes his mind and comes all the way back and jumps down. And as he jumps down, this clawed hand comes out and he chops off the fingers and leaves. It's like the director has literally just told you that they have they, they can't work outdoors. Well, they well, he's can. Got he's kind of barricaded in there. In there. <laughs> <sighs> and, well, that alien does manage to break himself free. Thank you. So it's not like he's, you know, trapped by a door. That, that that whole meme has just gone 
gone overboard, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't How make long sense. was he trapped? He's trapped in there for at least a day. We don't know because... Because he doesn't turn up until the end of the film. Graham Hess leaves, so we don't know how yeah, long yeah. aliens in there yeah, for. Yeah, Graham... Minutes, hours. Graham leaves. Doesn't bother to call anybody to tell them that there's an alien creature locked in a parlour. You know, doesn't try to, you know, get a bigger weapon so that maybe he can beat the fuck out of this fucking thing because it's it's causing trouble around the planet. You know, we're, like you said, we're supposed to be scared of this thing. It's supposed to be building up tension. He just walks away and goes home and sits there in front of his family and tells them, oh, no, we should be okay. Why? Because they can't open doors. He said, I didn't say, Mel Gibson said that as a line to Joaquin Phoenix. These aliens... They can't seem to work doors. And I'm sat there like... So, they travel all this way. They've got cloaking technology. They've sent a scouting party, because the army guy has already told us that he feels like this is a reconnaissance party setting up for something big and major. They've got a reconnaissance party coming in. They, they don't seem to do anything other than try to uh, grab you and try to take you back to their ship, wherever their ship is. I don't know where th where that well, is. they're it, cloaked. So. Yeah, have they got yeah, but have they got transporters, teleporters, shuttlecrafts? See, don't know. Don't, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. They're, it's a, you see, it's starting to just become, for me, it's a, just another domino. Oh, I don't know that, so knock it over. Don't know that, don't knock it over. And I can't ignore that. I'm usually more terrified of what you don't know than what you do know. <laughs> but some films deliver the I don't know that you imagine does it your imagination does it better fills in the gap and the film fills in the hole later on this one doesn't do that this one you know he sits there in front of his family and goes right okay let's make a vote we need to get out of here and you know for a fact that they aren't because we're staying basis on this one family so they're staying here let's put it to a vote I vote that we move to a lake and go somewhere with water you know, and so it's two on two. You've got Meryl and Morgan who want to stay. And you've got Bo and the father who want to who uh, who want to go. And then Mel Gibson's like, I outvote all of you because I'm two parents. And Morgan starts giving him shit, and he just stands there and fucking takes it. This is the patriarch of the family, the guy who's trying to protect them all, trying to keep them all safe. He is trying to get them out of a serious situation, but his. 11 year old son tells him no dad fuck you i'm staying and it all just collapses and they decide to just board up the windows and I mean, and as you say the alien's going to get out anyway so what are these boards actually going to do nothing exactly so there is no defense there is no point for this family to stay there you're just putting your family at more risk yeah we're going to board up every window in this house i don't know boards will do anything because they seem to have trouble with pantry doors. So before they board up the house and mm. prepare for the CT, um, Graham decides to get the family together to have one last meal. You know, he's unable to, um, you know, to, to convince the family to leave. So he's just like, well, I'll just cook everyone whatever they want. We're just going to sit and have what could be their last meal together. Yeah. And, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a breaking moment for, for Graham where... You know, he gets angry. He's like, well, eat your food and enjoy it. Um, but, you know, the, the but family they, breaks. Yeah, because they want him to say grace. Yeah, and he's not going to do it. You know, he's still unable to deal with the events that happened six months ago. And uh, and so he just ends up breaking down crying. And he ends up pulling his family in together. You know, he even kind of gra grabs his brother in, mm. into the hug as well. Yeah. And it's at that moment, again, when the family are all connected that the receiver comes alive and they can hear the alien kind of transmission. Mm -hmm. Similar to the first time they got the transmission was when they were all connected to each other yeah. uh, on the car. Yeah. And it just kind of suggests to you that once the family are working together and bond together, that, you know, that they, they can hear the alien transmission, that they can actually work together to overcome it. That's what the film suggests to me. Yeah, yeah. And so and, and that that sequence at the dinner table I thought was really well acted. You know, I've I kinda of had my issues with uh, Rory Culkin throughout the film. Mm. Both him and the daughter, they just did seem odd. Um but I, I put that down to the fact that they've you know, they lost their mother and at the same time lost their father at the same time. And they've kind of had their uncle looking after them for the last mm, six months. Yeah, and that yeah. they're a little bit estranged. Uh, but then it comes to the boarding up sequence. And I, I really like the camera work. I like the way that the boards go over the camera and the camera moves. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, the boards yeah. go over the camera again. 
and I just thought that the tension and the suspense had built up beautifully to this point where Graham starts talking to his children and explaining to them how they were born, how they came into the world, because in his eye, they're all going to die tonight in this house. You know, that's the way I think he almost sees it. And so he just, you know, he just wants to talk to them. He's trying to be a father again mm. uh, to his kids more than, than the spiritual sense. And, you know, one of my favorite scenes in the film earlier on was when he was sat on the sofa with his brother talking about that there are two different types of people in the world. There are, you know, those that there are those that uh, that don't believe and kind of are alone in that regard mm -hmm. and therefore yeah. frightened. Mm -hmm. And then those that, that aren't. Yeah. There is no one watching out for us, Meryl. We are all on our own. And it's kind of like he's having that realization now where he's having, you know, the, the flashbacks or as throughout the film, they were kind of seen as his dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because every time he keeps waking up from them. So I'm like, are they half memory, half dream flashbacks? You know, but then towards the end, they are literally just flashbacks. He's, yeah, he's still yeah. awake while yeah, he's having yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and that's where the title of the film comes in, where it's like where he's looking for a sign, a sign of to reaffirm his faith other than the, the crop circle signs out, out in the back garden. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and all of, the, all of the little links that have been set up throughout the film, and including from his wife's kind of dying words, kind of make sense. Yeah, yeah, I can't deny that. During all, this, all these sequences as well, the aliens <clears throat> are trying to get into the house. We hear them at the front door, we hear them round the back, we see the shadows moving around, mm. uh, and then they get into the house because they forgot that there was a hatch up into the attic that the aliens have gotten in. Yeah, not the fact that they, that they didn't board up any of the bedroom windows. You know, and that they could just smash the windows and climb I'm pretty sure they boarded them up as no, well. No, but Joaquin Phoenix came down and says there's not enough boards to board to up all the windows upstairs. And so um, Mel Gibson says, we'll just board up the doors. Yeah. And it's like, right, okay, that, 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 that makes sense. If you cannot defend all the windows, you might as well defend the easiest parts. But yeah, then they go, oh yeah, we've got the attic hatch. I'm like, you dumbass fucks. <laughs> How did you forget your own fucking house? Like, like, you, like, you should know like, all the fucking time where all the entrances into your fucking places. But no, let's all, go to the basement. Yeah, almost like in a, a homage to War of the Worlds, they end up in the coal basement. Yeah, <laughs> uh, where you know they they see an alien arm has kind of come through and attacks Morgan. Ah, oh, man, the coal shoot bit. I mean, come on, that was stupidly fucking placed. It's like we're in this place. Oh, there's a coal chute down here, so we've got to protect it. Okay, well, here's a torch. I'll go left. Here's another torch. I'll go right. So you get that camera angle of the two actors, two lead actors going left. And then they bring their camera, the, the, their uh, torches together. And guess where Morgan is? Stood in front of the fucking coal hatch to be grabbed by an alien. Because this, this then starts to lead up to... a. a I wanted it to be a, a really strong moment of the film, but with everything I'd actually sat through for the, like the last fucking hour and a half, I was actually just counting down the minutes, hoping that it would end because we 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 got told earlier and we got shown a couple of signs that Morgan suffers from asthma, so you know that's going to play up in the movie at some point, and he gets attacked by this creature and it sets off an asthma attack. And so Mel Gibson obviously has to calm him down, has to get him to breathe. And it was a really tense moment, you know, as a father myself, you know, you're just like, oh, don't, please don't do this. But then at the same time with what I had seen of the creatures and what, Mel, what I had experienced through Mel Gibson's eyes, you could have probably have put up a pretty good defense against them. You know, all you'd need is a couple of big sticks of wood and some nails in. These things don't have lasers. They don't have any special powers. They're, from Gary's perspective, hiding in bushes, terrified of us. So you're able to beat the fuck out of them and get your son's medicine. But obviously the film is trying to make you feel tense. That obviously the, 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 you know, the son's in terrible danger. And we find out the next morning when they wake up. Because uh, uh, Joaquin Phoenix has been listening to the radio he's found. That the alien creatures have just left. They've just gone. 
You know, we don't we don't get told through the radio. It's kind of the film's sneaky way of not telling us how this all ends is by saying, "Well, it was it was something, but we haven't had confirmed reports what it was." But I mean, all the the UFOs were invisible or cloaked anyway. So how did they know they were all gone? <laughs> <laughs> but they decide then to obviously go upstairs and find the medicine, and and Meryl and Graham sneak up the stairs they're looking for the medicine they're trying to get obviously morgan better and as they're about to um turn on the tv they well, he wheels the tv out yeah we see the reflection of the alien creature in the in the it's another TV. great kind of jump scare reveal without the dramatic music it's just kind of there it was the, the tv reflection was really well but then when the cameras did focus on the alien i was like yeah, it's some of the most atrocious alien CGI I think like, I've ever seen. That's it. I think I would have preferred it just guerrilla style. Like, you know, just through reflections. Just through, I don't know, stuff being thrown around. I, I think the film would have done better with us not seeing the alien creatures at all. I know, I, I, like, the ships? Fine. Well, originally, fine, the alien creatures... M. Night wanted all the aliens to be invisible or to have cloaking technology on them as well. Right, Predator but style. When, yeah, like Predator yeah, style, yeah, yeah. but when they were doing the tests, he was just like, yeah, okay, it's not quite right, plus it's costing way too much to do it. Didn't they even say at one point that the aliens have like a kind of uh, a, a camouflage? You yeah, know, well, you see it when, skin when he's holding the boy, you yeah, can yeah. see that the severed fingers yeah, and his hand is the same colour as the shirt that he's yeah, wearing yeah, kids. Yeah. So yeah, they can blend in. I just think it was just too much, like I said, because the film for me was going in two different angles... If they, if if we'd only if we'd never seen the aliens but kept focused on the family trauma, I'd have probably enjoyed it a lot more. But because we were trying to also see what the aliens look like, their ships, we're trying to work out who they are, what they're, where they are, where they're from. But I, it's I, the I, alien I'm attack. like, I can't, I can't go both ways. I can only go one way. But it's the alien attack that brings the family together, though. But even so, yeah, but you just said you said it many times. It's not really an attack, though, is it? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, that one alien in the house attacking them and attempting to take Morgan away. Yeah. Yeah, you know, well, and that that is. Well, that's it. I mean, we we say he's attempting to take Morgan away, but the, this this creature, Stumpy, I'll call him. You know, has has purposely come from from Ray's house and followed Graham all the way to his house. So I start to think, well, is this the same one that was on top of the barn and hiding in the bushes? You know, is he is he that one reconnaissance guy who's come down and he, and he set the map for the alien crafts to come down? Because, like Joaquin Phoenix said, there should be an alien craft like a mile away nearby, mm -hmm. you know. But now they've all buggered off, and so this guy's been left, and he grabs Morgan. And while Morgan is kind of desperately not trying to have an asthma attack at the same time, he sprays him in the face with this gas stuff. Was that to sedate him, to kill him? Why didn't they use all this stuff to kill us all? You know, if you. It, too many questions, and I'm not going there anymore because we'll be here all fucking day. And he sprays him in the face, and we see Graham have this flashback, the conversation he has with his wife as she dies, and she explains to him what she wants him to say to Morgan, what he wants her, him to tell Bo, and what he, he needs to believe, and what Meryl needs to believe. And so he takes that line and says, Meryl, swing away. And Meryl goes, look at my baseball bat hanging on the wall, you know. I'm going to use this now and swings away and just starts beating the fuck out of this alien to no avail because the alien seems to just be able to take every fucking shot. But just get shot. battered by yeah, it, literally. Yeah, it just... But until, you know, because uh, Bo had been leaving the glasses of water everywhere, yeah. you know, one of them Wasteful gets... Wasteful bitch. <laughs> one of them gets splashed on the alien during during the, this moment. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he realized, Meryl realises the alien is allergic to this water... <laughs> And kind of knocks the alien out and you get that final shot of the glass tipping over it, on top it, of the alien. Is it just fresh water or, or is it all water? It's probably, you know, it's, it doesn't, don't know. You don't know. Because the because these alien creatures came to our, to harvest or, or, or they, I mean, they might have been lost. Yeah, looking exactly. For, they looking might have for been directions. lost. And going, hey, maybe it's like Alien Nation. You know, 70% of the planet is covered in salt water, but it's like battery acid to them. But fresh water is even worse. But, it's like, but they're starving. they got to go there. It's fucking hell. Oh, you know? And it's like, well, is it... Why didn't they write in the fucking corn? We need help. Because <laughs> they don't know how to communicate with us. 
You know, they're they're scared that they'll get nuked, that they'll get shot out of the sky. Well, by yes, us. you fucking will, because we've been invaded so many times. We ain't taking shit from nobody. And if you're gonna turn up at some fucking kid's birthday party and freak everybody out, we're gonna see it's aggressive. <laughs> I know. I can only imagine all the aliens in the ship looking, watching the news, and going, "Shit, they've seen all the lights. Turn, turn, turn the, the lights on, yeah. Phil. Turn that fucking shit off." <laughs> Fuck, sorry, my fault. <laughs> but Graham whips Morgan outside and just kind of prays at this point. He prays and uses science to save his son. You know, he prays to God, but then he uses the science of the asthma. You know, his lungs would have been closed because he was in the middle of an asthma attack, so he would never have taken any of this dust in. And I'm sat there going, Pick a fucking side, Mel Gibson. You can't be a religious priest and fully involved in He's science, saying, even yeah. though you've just seen the most biggest intergalactic experience of your life. You're still going to believe it, that God it, helped you. It cuts back to the sequence where he was sat with Meryl on the sofa where he's just explaining, you know, of coincidences and whether you believe in them yeah, or not. Yeah, yeah, I know. And he's just saying that all these coincidences are a sign from his past wife or from God that has enabled the family to come together and survive this attack unharmed. And that there is enough for him to regain his faith. Yay! Because the film ends with him walking out of a room with the fucking dog collar on and he's so happy and I'm sat there like, so you're going to go and, you know, do a priest thing now, right? You're going to stand in front of a large congregation and tell them about how God created everybody equal including the aliens that invaded us about 10 minutes ago. So, favourite scenes from Signs, Ian? <laughs> I did have a few, actually. Like Gary said, there are some comedy moments. I think they are massively ill-placed and shouldn't be part of the story. But with the great, incredible acting that you have behind some of the parts, it did come across really, really well. Meryl and Graham acting crazy. You know, it's, it's so weird seeing Joaquin Phoenix so young. Yeah, and yeah. then going up against somebody as such a veteran as Mel Gibson and telling him to act crazy. You know, this is Mad Max we're talking to. This is boop, 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 boop. This is fucking, you know, lethal weapon fucking rigs. He's talking and he's like, I don't know how to act crazy. I don't know how to swear. I'm like, that's fucking funny, Mel Gibson. That's funny. That's acting. That's <laughs> really funny. And then when they're running outside and he's like, I'm out of my mind. <laughs> we're going to tear your head off. I'm losing my mind! It's time for an ass whooping! <laughs> that, it, you know, it, was, it was good. And, and it like endeared said, me to him more. It just broke, it broke the tension and suspense for me, which I felt was really bad because that's what I was hoping would It didn't going. break it, it just lulled it, it before broke, it, it built the tension It broke again. it for me. It may not have broken for you, but it broke it for me. Um, same with the same with the sequence with the girl in the um, the store, you know, who wanted to to, to get rid of all of her fucking you know yeah. sins to this father and he's, his douchebag a curse word. Uh, yeah, his douchebag curse word, you know, and he's he's like, he's like, I haven't been a priest for six months. She's like, but I need you because everyone's telling me this is the end of the world and I don't know what's going on. Father. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And Mel Gibson, honestly, at that point when you see him in that shot, just kind of staring, that's kind of my face about forty five minutes into this movie, like. I, don't know, I like the old man that kind of creeps over his corn over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> or I like the old man in the bookstore who's like, eh, it's not an alien invasion, they're just trying to sell soda. And I've counted 12 soda episodes. And I started to question, because the film, I'd lost the film after about 40 minutes. I started to question if that was the aliens. If the aliens were packing into advertisement so that people would drink more coke and not have any water in the house as a weapon. To me, that's just the case of the media using a worldwide event to sell more coke. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. well, I mean, they, they weren't using it for anything else, were they? Because they weren't doing anything with the ships. You know, they weren't doing anything. The only fucking footage they had of an alien ship came from other people who sent it to somebody else. I'm yeah. like, these are major media corporations. But like I said, they're trying to just keep the focus on the family. So they've got rid of Fox and they've got rid of Washington and they've got rid of all the big stuff that we need and we're just left with nothing. I really like the tinfoil hat sequence, you know, Dr. Bimboo. It was a good conversation because I've had some of them with, with, with my son where it's like, you know, he'll snatch stuff off me and be like, don't take the mick out of this. I believe this. And you're like, okay, and you then have to, it's the way that 
Rory Culkin turned to him and said, you had a tone. And I'm like, yeah, I know how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tells me I've got a tone, I'm like, I don't know what got into me. <laughs> we can make fun of it and forget it. This is serious. I don't know what got into me. Um, but yeah, that that was about it. Just the, those three comedy moments. Yeah, I had a fair few favourite scenes or memorable scenes from the film. I lo I love the uh, if there's anyone watching out for us conversation on the sofa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where the two kids are asleep and the two of them are kind of watching the news, just absorbing all this information. Yeah. You know, and I just imagine that's how everyone in the world would be if you know such a, an event were to occur. <laughs> everyone would be you know glued to the news to find out what's happening next. I, either that or stood on a, or stood on top of a building with signs saying "Take me home." Bring back Elvis. Yeah, bring back Elvis. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and so I kind of believed it, and uh, and the conversation I thought really, really worked, uh, and it gave a chance for both the actors to really emote really well, and mm. I got a good sense of the family, and it's just a couple of camera shots or a couple of a camera angles, um, and it was you know a good te six to ten minute piece of the film. Uh, I just thought it worked really, really well. I really like the use of uh, of music and and sound in the film. Right. Uh, there's a couple of instances where. Uh, you hear the crickets outside, and then oh, it, yeah, just yeah. it just goes silent. Did they eat like, all the crickets? No, I think the crickets were just spooked, or you know, or just you know, afraid. You yeah, know? and so they just went silent. Or the fact that yeah, all the crickets did were just killed by something. Yeah, uh, I just thought it was a very creepy and effective yeah, uh, yeah, moment. Yeah, it was. Yeah. The music was done by James Newton Howard. Right. And he did the score for the film, and you know it reminded me of uh, a bit of Psycho, a bit of um, the Twilight Zone, uh, and the fact that the the music was very um, understated. You know, yeah, the music hits you right at the beginning of the film with the yeah. Dun, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. But then the rest of the film it is just really quiet. It's just you know you do, it doesn't hit you with a bong jump scare moments. It's just kind of a Twilight Zone ish kind of a few note riffs. Yeah, and I think I've, I think you've nailed nailed it on the head. Then why I dislike the movie is because the music kept the film going so well, but the scenes were just that stuff didn't work. You know, I was completely thrown off at the beginning when it, when we had like a whole elongated credit sequence. I'm like, fucking hell, when was the last time I watched <laughs> a film which actually had the credit sequence at the start before the films even started? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, 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 like I said, I was I was into it, but then taking the music away and just trying to rely on which direction the movie was going, I'm like... <sighs> yeah, yeah. I just thought that the music complemented the film really, really well. Mm. <laughs> the uh, when Whacking Phoenix is in the closet watching the TV and uh, that alien scare, you know, at, at the kids' party, I just thought it was a great moment. You know, I was with Whacking Phoenix. Like when he reacts that way, it's kind of like you have the same reaction. You can just imagine the reality of it. The first ever alien actually caught on tape, compared to the thousands that are on YouTube <laughs> right now. You know, the hoaxes. I just thought that was great. That was really well done. Well, I'll tell you, the stuff on YouTube now is actually. The CGI is better in that than it is in this movie. Yeah, yeah, I know the CGI is, is really dated. Because <laughs> he just walks, bad. he walks back. He, he, the alien basically does the Sasquatch pose from that old video. He just kind of walks past, looking like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like selfie. <laughs> but I, I, I do have to recommend Signs. Uh, I think this is a very suspenseful and effective drama about an alien invasion and one man's test of faith. I think the performances are very good, and, and uh, Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix are on top form here. Uh, the music, also perfect in capturing the suspense, with lots of build-up, uh, with the crescendo with the alien attack. Uh, I really like watching the events through the eyes of one family. It lends to a degree of investment in the film and in the world around them. Uh, I think there's some good mystery, uh, some decent horror, and, and great performances. I think this is one of... M. Night Shyamalan's best films. <laughs> sorry. 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 Sorry, everybody. Sorry. It's just, just, it's definitely not one of his best films. Um, this movie is boring as fuck. Uh, nothing happens for an hour and 30 minutes. And all the suspense and build up and stuff, I feel is just kind of just, 
it's demolished at certain points with the comedy routines, with the bad special effects, with the with the way the storyline tries to develop. Is this an alien invasion? Is it not? What kind of creatures are these? I, I, after a while, I, I honestly stop caring. You know, 30 minutes into the movie, I was bored as fuck and I wanted to turn it off, but I, 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 I persevered. 45 minutes into the movie, I started to think of other alien invasion type movies or any movies where aliens are involved with humans that I prefer to watch. District 9, Alien Nation, Mars Attacks, Skyline, Battle for Los Angeles, Independence Day, even fucking Pixels is better than this. M. Night Shyamalan had, I won't take it away, he had what started off as a good idea, but he was unable to follow in one direction. He wanted us to feel sympathy for the family and at the same time feel tension for these creatures. But we don't ever see the creatures that enough to actually be scared enough by them. And the family, they're all so independent that they could all survive willingly on their own without any support from anybody else. But it's only this family tragedy thing that actually keeps them trying to come back together. And it's all Mel Gibson's fault for not actually dealing with that sooner. Okay, don't get me wrong, family tragedies are hard to get through, but six months with two small children running around your house, you are not actually gonna take the time to sit down and explain to them what's going on and what you're going to do. You're also built, you've, you've also got this massive, huge fucking farm to take care of. He does not look like a farmer. He doesn't look like he's got any of the equipment to take care of any of these fields. And yet we're, yeah, it's the basis of the movie. We're gonna put a massive sign in front of this cornfield, okay, so that the aliens can come down and use it as a marker. And when they then finally come down, they realize it's a really bad idea and they fuck off. If you do, though, feel like you need to watch signs, then go right ahead. And maybe I missed something, but this is the second time I've watched this film. And it's the second time I don't like it. And I will not be coming back a third. <laughs> Agree to disagree, Ian. No, I'm sure we will. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm losing my mind!